Hello and welcome. The session will begin momentarily. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all, and welcome to World Water Week. My name is Katie Lackey, and I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. on Indigenous Piscataue and Anacostan land. I'm a senior program manager at the U.S. Water Alliance and a member of this year's Young Scientific Program Committee for Seaweeds World Water Week. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first of three dynamic sessions in the seminar series on information, governance, and justice for climate resilience. This three-part series will look at how we can accelerate resilience in the water sector and communities across all regions and nations. This is a pre-recorded session and questions for speakers can be submitted on the Pathable platform via chat. We will monitor activity and do our best to answer your questions during session two which is taking place live tomorrow on Tuesday, 24 August at 3 p.m. Central European time here at World Water Week. Now, as we get started, I'd like to send a big thank you to our four seminar co-conveners, the Asian Di Disaster Preparedness Center, Stockholm University's Environmental Law and Policy Center, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, and the UNDP Siwi Water Governance Facility. The seminar series would not be possible without their generous support and expertise, so thank you. Over the past year, we have faced a global pandemic and economic crises rippling through our communities. This time has elevated the value and importance of water, as well as threatened democratic principles. It has challenged our very way of life, and our capacity to manage and mitigate flooding disasters, let alone respond to slow moving climate impacts such as droughts and heat waves. Now more than ever, the use of data and information, ground truthing and strengthening governance is essential in responding to today's challenges and preparing for the future. In today's sessions, speakers will share stories and concrete examples of how climate information, inclusive stakeholder engagement, and participatory decision-making are critically linked and essential. They will discuss building a resilient water future in communities across India, West Africa, the Okavango Delta, Tanzania, Yemen, and Australia. But first, let me take us to the United States, where it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Radhika Fox. Radhika is the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. The Office of Water works to ensure that drinking water is safe, wastewater safely returned to the environment, and surface waters are properly managed and protected. Radhika was nominated by the Biden-Harris administration in early 2021 and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in June. She is the first woman of color to hold this high-ranking office. Prior to joining the EPA, Radhika served as the Chief Executive Officer for the U.S. Water Alliance and Value of Water Campaign, Director of Policy and Government Affairs for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and as the Federal Policy Director at PolicyLink. With over two decades of experience working at the local, state, and federal level, Radhika is known as a champion for water infrastructure, governance, innovative finance, affordability, equity, and the evolution of the One Water Movement. Welcome, Ms. Fox. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to join this World Water Week conversation and speak with dedicated water practitioners from across the globe. 
But anyone who knows me will tell you that I cannot wait to get together in person in Stockholm again and share our stories, our strategies, and our passion for water. Until then, I commend Siwi for keeping that spirit alive in this virtual event. In addition to keeping us apart this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought focus to the essential role of safe water for drinking, hygiene, and recreation. In the United States, we've worked hard to establish and maintain systems that for most people deliver safe water day in and day out. Throughout the pandemic, the water sector has shown unbelievable dedication to serving communities and keeping vital water services going. We're so grateful to the utility workers and managers, and we are so proud to support and highlight their efforts. But the pandemic has exacerbated inequities in water security, economic security, and opportunity in our communities. Unfortunately, we see more of the same when we look at other global challenges, such as the climate crisis. I often say that climate stress is experienced as water stress in the form of drought, flood, sea level rise, warming waters, and so much more. And it's communities of color and low income people who are often hurt first and worst by these water related climate stressors. And to be clear, climate change is already here. We're witnessing it. It's devastating impacts through extreme weather events around the world and at home here in the United States. We must take action to halt climate change and to build resilience to avoid the worst of climate impacts. And so let me share with you a little bit on how the Biden-Harris administration is taking action. From day one, President Biden has put an emphasis on working towards uh, solving the threat of climate change. He's directed us through his executive order tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad to take a whole of government approach. And this is some of the things we're doing in the context of the Office of Water. First, we are supporting climate resilient water supplies and resilient water infrastructure. For the first time this year, EPA included protecting water infrastructure against the impacts of climate change as a priority under our highly successful WIFIA financing program, which has committed more than $10 million to support more than 50 infrastructure projects across the United States. We're also leading an effort to increase water reuse domestically and abroad to strengthen water security and climate resilience. But we also think that water can play such an important role as far as the mitigation solution to the climate crisis. We think there's tremendous opportunities to reduce greenhouse gases by increasing energy efficiency at water utilities and finding innovative ways to produce renewable energy at water treatment plants. Our core philosophy that we have at the EPA and that I personally hold is that we must embed equity and environmental justice into everything that we do. And we're, in, we're committed here at the EPA to ensure that our decisions are informed by the lived experience and wisdom of the environmental justice communities most impacted by climate change and the many other water challenges that we face. I often say it's water's moments and it, it truly is such an exciting time to be in the water sector. Um, for example, in the United States, we have a historic water infrastructure proposal that's being uh, advanced in a bipartisan fashion. The president, vice president and Congress are all working very closely together on this historic infrastructure proposal. And, and we know and we've seen time and again that investing in infrastructure is one of the best decisions that we can make to protect public health, ensure safe water quality, create jobs, and establish more equitable outcomes for everyone. Um, I want to talk now for just a moment about our international contribution um, and the ways in which the U.S. government is engaging uh, with our global partners. Our efforts are guided by the U.S. Global Water Strategy, a strategy that aims to provide water security to reduce disease, promote economic prosperity, and increase peace and security. To achieve these goals, the U.S. Global Water Strategy has laid out four objectives. First, the U.S. hopes to increase sustainable access to safe drinking water and sanitation services, along with key hygiene practices. Second, the U.S. Global Water Strategy encourages sound management and protection of freshwater resources. 
Third, we promote cooperation on shared waters. And finally, we want to strengthen water sector institutions, governance, and financing. To help make these goals a reality, the U.S. provides technical assistance and makes targeted investments in say, sustainable infrastructure and services. We promote science, technology, information, and we mobilize financial resources. And of course, we engage diplomatically to strengthen partnerships with countries and with and intergovernmental organizations. As I mentioned, in the US, we have found that investing in water infrastructure is one of the best decisions a government can make. And so we strive to apply this experience globally as one of the world's largest water sector donors. We invest in capacity building, infrastructure, science and technology, and, innov and innovative financial instruments to mobilize local capital. So in closing, um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you for this very important discussion. The impacts of climate change on our water resources are far reaching and it will take immense collaboration to address, which is why forums like World Water Week are important and make me so optimistic about the incredible work that's being done and will be accomplished going forward. Thank you and happy World Water Week. Thank you so much, Radhika. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Seneca Basanyake, Climate Resilience Director and Weather and Climate Theme Lead for the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. Dr. Basanyake will provide a brief introduction on climate information services. Then he'll hand it over to Mr. Ashwin Vishwanath of the Asian Development Bank and Dr. Yafet Anderson of the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute for presentations. Hello everyone. Climate Information Service. It is an aid to support individuals, communities, organizations to make improved ex ante decision making. In the present day context, it is widely used for minimizing climate and disaster risks which are emerging from hydro meteorological extreme events. Reliable climate information is of vital importance for improving early warning systems uh, for cyclones, floods, droughts, heat waves and other related hydro meteorological hazards which we have seen in the recent past from North America, Western Europe and China. Global Framework for Climate Services of WMO promotes countries to improve, enhance climate services by strengthening production, delivery, availability, accessibility, and application of uh, science-based uh, predictions. Understanding risk is the key for minimizing climate and disaster risk. So it is one of the priorities and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which was one of the global frameworks adopted in 2015. Hazard modeling or hazard identification um, is a major input for climate and disaster risk assessment. So weather and climate data play important roles in the whole process of climate and uh, disaster risk assessment. In this session, there will be two interesting case studies from South Asia, West Africa on effective flood disaster risk management and early warning systems, which highlight the importance of climate information service. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I am Ashwin. I will be presenting my case on strengthening climate resilience through improved disaster risk management in Kolkata of India. I'll be talking on the flood forecasting and early warning system established in the city, its features and benefits. The system was financed by Asian Development Bank. As you all are aware, the bank works with developing member countries for poverty elevation. And as per our strategy 2030, we have a goal for prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and Pacific. Kolkata is a metropolitan city in India and it is capital city of the state of West Bengal. Kolkata metropolitan area is the largest urban agglomeration in western part of India, and it has many urban local bodies 
and Kolkata Municipal Corporation is one among them. The corporation spreads over an area of 203 square kilometers with a population of 4.5 million as per 2011 census. The city lies on the edge of indo genetic River Plain and River Hooghly, which is a distributor of River Ganga, abuts the city. ADB has a long partnership with Kolkata Municipal Corporation. Since the year 2000, various ADB loans, the Kolkata Environmental Improvement Project, its supplementary loan, and the ongoing Kolkata Environmental Improvement Investment Program have assisted the corporation in improving the city's resilience through expansion of drainage system, sewerage system, and improvement in water supply services. Kolkata is highly vulnerable to adverse climate events because of its topographic, developmental, climate, and demographic situation. Flooding is caused by three factors in Kolkata. First is the natural factor. The city experiences pluvial flooding as it is largely settled in a flat terrain with inadequate natural drainage combined with high intensity rainfall. Second is the developmental factor. Due to unplanned and unregulated urbanization, low capacity drainage facilities, infrastructure development that is not keeping pace with the demand for the growth of the city, are the reasons causing stress on the existing drainage system. Third is climate change aspects, which leads to changes such as increase in the intensity of rainfall, sea level rise, and increase in the cyclone surges that might increase the intensity and duration of the flooding events. Recently, state of West Bengal and Kolkata were affected with two cyclonic storms in as many number of years. Considering the high intensity rainfall events that are occurring on a regular basis, it was felt that early warning system is needed for emergency preparedness and for better disaster management in the city. ADP from its Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund extended technical assistance to Kolkata to support climate change resilience planning, disaster management resilience, and establishing flood forecasting and early warning system. Kolkata became first city in the country to get a comprehensive flood forecasting and early warning system. It is in operation since year 2018 and provides forecasts and real-time information on inundation and urban environmental data. Over 40 rain gauges and sensor network covering canals, 70 plus pumping stations, 80 streets, and 80 schools were installed. The system includes medium-term remote sensing modeling with granular and real-time data from the low-cost high-density sensor network, which provides information on flooding, pump operations, as well as air quality, heat stress, and humidity. The key features of this early warning system are it includes cost-effective sensors, and it provides real-time information and forecast on access anyway basis to the stakeholders. The system is available on cloud, and data can be accessed on KFLED website, as well as mobile app. There are multiple parameters that can be monitored in an urban setting apart from the flood data. It has time series that can be used to validate flood modeling and also provides flood scenarios that can be used to train the staff for emergency and disaster management. The system does have the provision for crowdsourcing, which can be used by municipal corporation in future. The Kolkata Municipal Corporation is deriving benefits from the system with access anywhere forecast and real-time data, which allows to have situational awareness among the corporation staff, and they can take informed decision to reduce the risk because of the flooding. The system can disseminate flood warning and evacuation information to the vulnerable people if communities get access to this forecast data. The system can also help in managing the hydrometeorological risks such as cyclones and other disastrous events that have become common for the city. By integrating the system with the improved stormwater drainage, 
The flood risk is reduced in about 4,800 hectares and expected to increase in days to come with support being provided by ADB for improving its drainage system. The system also helps in flood risk informed urban planning by learning from the local situation and the flooding of the past events. So to ensure sustainability, Kolkata Municipal Corporation has to build partnership with the private sector, civil society, as well as communities to mainstream resilience. Involvement of private sector would help in effective maintenance of the system with the private operator bringing in his expertise and resources. The community can also own the sensors through crowdsourcing that can be allow for increase in the sensor density and provide more localized inputs. The forecast data can be transmitted to multiple stakeholders, including the communities. Providing access to the police department, transport department, or other stakeholders could help to take decisions for diverting the traffic or deploy more resources to the affected area to minimize the risk. It is also advised to use the historical data to demonstrate pilot by adopting the local context for mitigating the flood risk through various means, mainly the nature-based solutions that can be scaled up throughout the city based on the successful pilot. Currently, ADB is planning to support Kolkata Municipal Corporation in this endeavor. So if you are interested to know more on the flood early warning system in Kolkata, its benefits are uh, any other features are about transformation that Kolkata is experiencing with the ADB's partnership. Please do visit the ADB website for the resources available online or follow the link provided here. I hope these resources would be useful to you. With this, I have come to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank CV for allowing me to present my case on Kolkata. So thank you all. Look forward to hear from you. Hello everyone, my name is Joffe Dandeshon and today I would like to tell you a little bit about the fun for project which has been co-developing a flood forecasting and alert system for West Africa. The motivation for this project really comes from that there's been a lot of challenges in the past decade of uh, flooding in the region with serious consequences like lives lost, crop damages, infrastructure damages and so on with millions affected. And a key need in many countries is to have access to up-to-date forecasts and alerts so that you can prepare for and respond to the situation in, in a better way. And climate change is, is putting sort of additional stress on this because more flooding is expected. So the, it sort of underlines the need for this kind of information. Our vision is long term. We want to have resilient societies with minimum flood impacts and with capable institutions, institutions that don't just know the problems, but also the solutions through knowledge, through tools, mandates and resources. And concretely, we work to reduce disaster risk through an operational forecasting and alert system. We've had a, a working, we've been working together for a long time, for more than 10 years in several projects with the cooperation with many agencies in West Africa, particularly AgriMet. And we've been uh, building capacity, but also worked technically on joint research and development. And the FANFAR project has been running since January 2018. It's financed by the European Commission and it has had two objectives. Uh, first, to build a pre-operational flood forecasting and alert system across West Africa, but also to do it together to reinforce the cooperation. One of the key achievements of FANFAR is that we've been working together with uh, more than 30 organizations from 17 countries to co-design the system, to decide what the system should look like with hydrological services agencies, with emergency management agencies, river basin organizations, and so on. And we've used a, a, a multi-criteria decision analysis to clarify user priorities. What is a good system? What's most prioritized? And the second achievement is that we've co-developed a flood forecasting and alert system that's been operational, providing uh, accessible one to 10 day forecasts, which has been updated every day for now three years roughly across West Africa. 
And this is an example, the map here is an example of uh, how to access this information through an open web interface. And there's also possibilities through emails and SMS alerts. And in parallel, we've been uh, building capacity through hands-on training on how to produce and use the information through workshops, through in-depth courses, through expert exchanges, using a variety of material, uh, wikis, video tutorials, social media, and so on. So let's look at what the West African agencies say about FANFAR. If we start with the key objectives, uh, the most important thing is to have high accuracy, but also to have clear information and that the information can be reliably accessed, that, it, that you can actually receive it. And if we look at the accuracy alone, uh, the graphs at the bottom show that the current accuracy of FANFAR is considered to be overall good. Sometimes neutral, sometimes very good, but overall good. And if we think about the future, 9 out of 10 say that they are likely to use the FANFAR system in the future. Now, another thing that's important is to prioritize, because resources are always limited. And one thing that has been prioritized here was to have an operational system, something that works every day, rather than having many features. And another thing that the agencies prioritized was to have a system for the national and regional agencies that would in turn use the information to pass on to their constituencies. So how is it working in reality? Well, let's look at uh, the case of Niamey, uh, the capital of Niger in 2020, where they had the, experienced the, the worst flood in 100 years. And you can see the photo, the extent of the flooding there with lots of consequences, several victims, hundreds of thousands affected and damages to agriculture, infrastructure, and so on. And on the left, you see the fanfare performance. Top left is the, the, uh, the map of, of the fanfare forecast in August 2020. And you can see uh, basically red indicates severe flood risk. And on the bottom left, you have local observations. The red line is 2020. And above the, let's say, the red threshold is, is a catastrophic flood, essentially. And you can see that the, the, the fanfare predicted the timing and also the severity of this event very well. However, the duration of it, the long duration of it lasting for more than a month was underestimated. And we've done these kind of collabor uh, collaborative evaluations together with West African ag agencies, both live during the events, but also retrospectively afterwards. Another example comes from Aishatu Ibrahim, Director of Engineering Hydrology at the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency. And she says like this, in September 2020, we received an early warning from the FANFOR system, which saved approximately 2,500 lives. The warning helped us evacuate five communities near the Jabadam before more than 200 houses were destroyed by the floods. And another a similar case at the Shiroro Dam also sa helped save the property. And FANFAR is already used beyond the project at national scales, sent through bulletins, social media, TV newspapers, and so on to other different stakeholders. But also on regional scale uh, through ECOWAS Flood Observatory. Uh, on local scale, for example, the Sirba River Early Warning System, SLAP is in Niger and used by the UN peacekeeping mission MINUSMA in Mali. And we have about uh, 100 uh, African users per month in, uh, of FANFAR. So let's look ahead towards sustainability. And our strategy has several components. Uh, one thing, key thing is to work in a tandem agile approach. Essentially that means to operate the system to provide real societal value uh, right away, updating the system every day and at the same time to build capacity and improve also the technical system to uh, make it more accurate, to uh, have better coverage, more reliable and so on. And we do that, uh, we want to do that through, of course, increased co collaboration through co-design, co-development and so on, using open source tools, open knowledge and, and, and uh, open data. And we have a concrete follow-up project in mind, but this needs financing. And essentially it's, it's about extending the cooperation between regional, national and international partners to build capable West African institutions and thereby minimize flood impacts and build more resilient societies in both present and future climates. 
So we invite you to help us realize this vision. I've provided two links where you can read more about the concrete follow-up project suggestions and also about us, the SMHI, the uh, institution that is organizing and coordinating this project. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to hearing from you again. Now that we have an understanding of how climate information systems help build resilience, we'll dive into approaches for climate and water governance. Introducing us to this topic is Dr. Yenny Gromwell, advisor for water policy and rights at the Stockholm International Water Institute and scientific program committee member for World Water Week. We'll then hear from Mr. Peter McArdle of the University of Sydney, Australia, Ms. Caroline Solik from Pegasus, and Dr. Jacob Eaton at the Iris Group International on different case studies. Over to you, Yenny. Hello, everyone. Water and climate interact. This was something we talked about last year in the seminar on information, governance, and justice for climate resilience. That session is still available if you want to catch up. This year, when the global conversation is about the value of water and climate, we must also appreciate the value of information flows and the sharing of data on which to base knowledge because society, communities and individuals depend on this to develop and survive when climate disasters become more common. For instance, in attribution studies, quantifying the evidence and analyzing observation points is the foundation for drawing causal links between extreme weather events and climate change. Data really is the lifeblood of decision making and the raw material for accountability, such as in monitoring the SDGs, as the former UN Deputy Secretary General John Eliasson has said. Some data can be collected through participatory processes. Crowdsourcing, citizen science and ground truthing are good examples that we will soon hear about. In turn, Climate information needs to be widely shared, aiming for maximum transparency. Participation in decision making, transparency and accountability are key principles of good governance, along with integrity or anti-corruption measures. Now, we will hear three stories about this, with examples of how to increase resilience to climate change. First, Peter McArdle will share community experiences of uncertainty and anxiety resulting from water scarcity and drought in Australia and the Yemen. Then we'll return to Africa for two stories on the governing of water and inclusion about stakeholder engagement methods in the Okavango by Caroline Solik and on ways of challenging social norms and increasing women's participation in decision making by Jay Keaton. Water is life. Critical human water needs. Essential, vital or basic water needs. At World Water Week, we hear this language a lot. It's not surprising, it's embedded in policy, legislation, human rights. But I'd like to ask you something. What are your critical water needs? What does that actually mean? I recently asked this to the head of a government water department in Australia, and he said this. Well, People have to be able to drink. Everyone agrees that critical human water needs come first. It's human health first and then we'll work out the rest afterwards. If people are dying because they don't have any water, then anything else is a moot point. Essentially he was saying that drinking water, because it physically keeps us alive, represents our most critical of water needs. It's what Maslow proposed in his famous theory of motivation. He called them the most prepotent of needs. Makes sense, right? Well, nobody's disputing that drinking water is essential for life, this much is obvious. But we can also ask, does someone have to be dying of thirst before their water needs are considered a crisis? So I did ask people. For the last few years I've been researching conflict and community resilience into highly water scarce but otherwise very different contexts in the Sarawat Mountains in Yemen and the Murray Darling Basin in Australia. For this study, I interviewed people who were in some cases high-level decision makers, some who were mid-level influencers such as industry or community leaders, and grassroots water users. I asked them about their water contexts, what fair sharing of scarce water resources would look like, 
as well as what stands in the way of that. Listening to people talk about their own first-hand experience of water scarcity, when the conversation is taken out of the halls of power and into a dry, dusty field, what quickly becomes evident is that it's not always a crisis of people running out of water, but a crisis of people anxious about running out of water. See, we mainly talk about water in terms of gigalitres, flow rates. It's relatively easy to quantify if we're talking about how much we need to physically stay alive. But if you start to talk about water in terms of, say, worry, stress, not knowing if the next rain is weeks or years away, suddenly a very different picture emerges. No longer are we just talking about how much is enough to have a drink. Now we're talking about helplessness, loss, trauma. When I asked people about their relationships with scarce water, they didn't just talk about thirst. No, they talked to me about mental health. They talked about anxiety and depression, employment, even crime rates. They spoke about the breakdown of social cohesion, of culture and community. And then on the flip side, they spoke about the immense weight lifted off their shoulders when that river eventually flowed again. At conferences, we hear a lot about transboundary conflict and cooperation. Usually what we mean by transboundary is when water flows across international or jurisdictional borders. If we think about hydro hegemony, the powers that be are typically states or governments. Certainly the people I interviewed did talk about cross-boundary water sharing and upstream downstream sharing dynamics were a significant source of insecurity and injustice. But there are other significant boundaries too. Some are unsurprising, like contention between industries, disputes between urban and rural users, or economic barriers around production or water prices. And then there were divisions that were less obvious. Almost everyone I interviewed at all levels said that one of the biggest barriers to fair and just water sharing was the flow of information where high-level decision makers struggled to disseminate their policies, tech people struggled to communicate complexity and water users were desperate for information and understanding. Timely, understandable information about water helps people to know what to expect, when to expect it, and why. As such, access to information is a key ingredient of water scarcity resilience. Another significant boundary that emerged was around access to social support mechanisms. It's no secret that water scarcity can shatter communities, and the devastating prevalence of self-harm among farmers during times of severe drought tells the story loud and clear. This is not just about water scarcity itself, it's equally about the immense pressures of uncertainty that come with it. Or more to the point, people's ability to feel safe and secure in the face of a variable and changing water supply. Water justice, it is clear, includes governance and social support mechanisms that help counter that uncertainty. Then, zooming out a bit, there's the purpose that water plays in people's lives fundamentally. For many people, particularly those coming from a Western background, water is valued for its utility. It's something that is consumed, used for production, and as a means of attaining and sustaining livelihoods. For others though, water has immense value not just in its use, but in its presence. While some people need water for livelihoods, for others, critical water needs are existential. I put it to you that just maybe, we tend to focus our attention on drinking water because we can measure it. It's clear and objective and it's tangible. Yet at the same time, some water justice issues are not easily addressed in numbers and statistics. Some can't be settled with an agreement and a signature, but instead require a continual, ongoing process. We talk about critical water needs as being just enough for a drink, but as humans, we also rely on water for health and well-being, for safety and security, and to keep our communities together. Water scarcity is not just about staying alive, it's also about how we live. It's about resilience. When water is scarce, we're less resilient to other challenges, disasters, or even a pandemic. Water is life, 
and it becomes critical well before people are thirsty. Thank you. Good day, all. Today, I'm going to be sharing my experiences of using a citizen science-based approach in the Kabango Okabango River Basin, where extensive stakeholder engagement was used to complement and deepen a desk-based livelihood vulnerability study. I'd like to begin by asking everyone to take a moment to think about what the term livelihood means to each of you. How would you describe your livelihood to someone? Does it generate income? Is it your full-time job? Do you do it alone, with a team, or with your family? Does it require water, energy, or transport? And what affects your livelihood? The weather, the economy, or maybe your physical capabilities? Without the luxury of being able to discuss these answers together in person today, I'd hazard a guess that everyone listening in would have a slightly different response to these questions. What this tells us is that it's impossible to come up with solutions to improve the livelihood of an individual or community without first allowing them the opportunity to define what the concept of livelihood actually means to them. This was one of the biggest learnings that came out of a series of community engagements in the Okavango River Basin, which centered around the topic of sustainable livelihoods. To provide some context, I was part of a team working with the Okavango River Basin Commission to design and implement livelihood projects in Angola, Botswana, and Namibia. Communities in these countries are exposed to a vast range of social, environmental, climatic, and political challenges, and require support to enhance their resilience to these external shocks and stresses. To identify these livelihood projects, we began with a desk-based approach that drew on extensive existing socioeconomic, environmental, and climate data to develop GIS maps of the basin. You can see an example of this on the screen now. When laid on top of one another, the maps collectively indicated areas that were exposed to hazards, such as floods, droughts, and diseases, as well as where compounding livelihood-related vulnerabilities existed, be these physical, economic, social, or environmental. You can see these on the screen now. We termed these areas hotspots. However, while this initial analysis provided a useful basis for identifying hotspots, we knew this information was largely static. It was not at a granular community scale and did not fully capture the dynamic nature of basin development. We knew that until we had this more detailed level of information, we would not be in a position to begin conceptualizing appropriate livelihood projects that addressed the specific community's needs. We therefore embarked on a process of conducting in-depth consultations with stakeholders who live and work in the basin, as well as climate scientists, sociologists, and various levels of government. The coming together of these different groups, who typically do not engage to collectively discuss and make decisions on livelihood issues, required an interactive approach that allowed for balanced sharing of information and opinions. A fundamental starting point for these discussions was the unpacking of key concepts to create a shared understanding of what terms meant to the stakeholders. These included terms like livelihoods, hazard, vulnerability, and adaptive capacity. We quickly learned that these terms were interpreted quite differently based on where the consultation was taking place and the group of stakeholders in the room. Once we'd converged on the meaning of key terms, we proceeded with interactive group work mapping exercises. Given the groups comprised different genders, ages, social hierarchies, cultures, and languages spoken, we found that group work discussions were most conducive when centered around map visuals of the area in question. Participants were divided into groups where our intention was to ensure a mix of representatives in each group. And they were tasked with, firstly, locating drivers that influence the economic, social, and environmental welfare of their livelihoods. We then asked them to determine whether these drivers were hazards or vulnerabilities. And finally, we asked them to identify these hazards and vulnerabilities on the maps. And where they compounded in a single geographic area, we considered that area a hotspot. 
This citizen science-based approach proved key to ensuring that the results and hotspot delineations reflected on the ground realities. It was really encouraging to realize that the hotspots identified by stakeholders were very closely aligned to those that had previously come out of our desk-based map work. It is, however, important to note that the stakeholders provided much more depth and granularity to the descriptions that underpinned the hotspots themselves, which in turn led to the design of more targeted project responses. These project responses were discussed at length with stakeholders who shared thoughts on which areas should be considered a priority and what infrastructural and governance solutions would be most appropriate. The consultations also provided a platform for the Okavango River Basin Commission to mediate discussions on how livelihood issues should be governed and how information should be shared and used by basin citizens, the scientific community, and importantly, government decision makers. The photograph you can see on the screen now is an example of the types of maps that were generated through group work. You'll see that colorful stickers were used to indicate different types of hazards and vulnerabilities, and where they're clustered together, they indicated potential hotspot areas. The outcomes of this group work in Angola, Botswana, and Namibia was used to generate this hotspot map, which is accompanied by written hotspot characterizations in all of the six areas outlined on the map. I've highlighted some of the characterizations that underpinned the fourth hotspot we identified, which is along the border of Angola and Namibia, and some examples of the issues that we describe in the characterization include those such as weak road infrastructure and wash facilities, high incidence of gender-based violence, extended droughts, and in certain parts, flash flooding, and high incidence of human-wildlife conflict. These engagements had the threefold benefit of extracting stakeholder knowledge and perspectives in a discursive and engaged manner, building national capacity around key climate concepts, and importantly, garnering consensus and ownership of the approach and its resultant outcomes. This buy-in was the most fundamental aspect of the process, given the hotspot map is considered a living tool, which will be updated as circumstances in the basin evolve and as information becomes more accessible and granular. The outcomes of this work are now being used by decision makers and financiers to support more strategic, inclusive and impactful investments in the basin that best serve communities most in need. In closing, I'd like to thank you for your time and encourage you to look for more information on our approach at our website, crediff.net. You can also watch a 10 minute documentary on the consultation process as we moved through Botswana, Namibia and Angola. Alternatively, please contact me for more information, which I'd readily share with you. Hello everyone in Hamjambo. Today I will be speaking about the upward intervention in Tanzania. Upward, which stands for Uplifting Women's Participation in Water-Related Decision-Making, is one of the first interventions to address gendered social norms in pursuit of gender equality and improved wash outcomes. The goal of our intervention was to increase the meaningful participation of women in decision-making relating to water governance and use. Upward did this over a four-month intervention period, using mixed-gender community facilitation teams training critical reflection practices, organized diffusion, and the intersection of gender and wash. The project was implemented within the context of the USAID Tanzania Water Resources Integration Development Initiative, also known as WARIDI, a five-year project led by Tetra Tech. It was designed to help Tanzania improve the management of its water resources and supply services, improve sanitation, create livelihoods and wash services, and promote resilient communities in the face of climate change. The project was conducted in two water basins in Tanzania, Wami Ruvu and Rufiji. At the beginning of the Waridi project, IRIS Group, in the role of supporting gender integration and youth engagement, conducted a gender integration and youth inclusion assessment through desk review, key informant interviews, and focus group discussions. A key finding of this assessment was the need to better understand and address social norms influencing the gendered patterns and representation and participation in water-related decisions. The team designed Upward as a pilot intervention to shift these social norms. In our formative and baseline research, participants revealed many harmful gender norms that substantially limited women's ability to participate in water governance structures. 
These included that men's opinions were regarded as more important, more beneficial to all community members, and were taken to be final decisions. That even when women did participate, they were expected to act shy and demure, to never speak after men or to contradict them. Some women would also ridicule other women for being outspoken. And at the household level, we found that men whose wives were outspoken in meetings would be regarded as, quote, less in control of their household, and they experienced sanctions in the form of ridicule from other men. Based on these findings, Upward sought to institute and strengthen gender equitable norms by reaching a critical mass of community members. We targeted participants in women's groups, formal leaders, and community leaders. Our long-term objectives were to increase support for women's participation in water-related decision-making from key community leaders and community members, and to increase women's participation and leadership in community-level governance structures. We delivered the intervention in two communities, Lulanzi Village in Oringa Region and Kanolo Village in Morogoro Region. We used the principle of organized diffusion in which direct participants are encouraged and given prompts to engage others in their community about topics covered in sessions. In each community, we already identified and trained a community facilitation team, also known as a CFT, of three women and three men. Between June and September of 2018, each CFT facilitated a series of community education and empowerment sessions. The guides for these sessions drew on best practices in participant-centered learning and drew on previous work by Care International, SASA, the International Women's Development Agency, and the University of Pennsylvania Social Norms Group. Specific sessions delivered by the CFTs included concepts such as gender equality and equity, the intersection of gender and wash, such as existing gender roles within water and sanitation, identification of and critical reflection about social norms, as well as skills for women in public speaking and advocacy. A key tool in reflection was the use of a participation ladder in which participants were asked to evaluate where they and other groups stood within governance structures, from token participation to active involvement to decision-making, and finally, ownership and control. Upward reached over 300 individuals directly, which was roughly 10% of the total village population. We evaluated the intervention at baseline in December 2017 and at inline in April 2019, roughly six months after CST, CFTs finished implementing the sessions. To identify social norms at baseline, we used two fictional vignettes. A trained facilitator reads a vignette to participants who are asked to consider how a character will behave in a situation which is likely to elicit pressure to comply with specific social norms. The fictional situation creates distance between its characters and respondents, which minimizes the risk of socially desirable responses. In the first vignette, Faraja, an unmarried woman of 22, is considering if she should participate in a village meeting. She wants to impress on the community the importance of paying water bills, but when she finally speaks, her voice is low and hard to hear. In the second vignette, Salma, a married woman aged 28, advocates in a village meeting for a new water point that is more advantageous to women. Other men in the community speak to her husband, Rashid, about her participation, and Rashid later confronts Salma at home. Our evaluation methodology drew on the social norms analysis plot, a tool piloted by Care International. A social norm exists and applies to a specific situation when the empirical expectations, or what I think others do, and normative expectations, what I think others think I should do are consistent across groups, in this case, men and women and youth and elders. By conducting separate focus groups of men and women and youth and elders, we're better able to see areas in which there's disagreement between groups. Using the same tool at baseline and inline allows us to see differences between time periods, differences in both, which would suggest some changes in social norms. After evaluation, we found greater support for women's water-related knowledge and more encouragement for women's participation in community settings, a stronger sense of solidarity among women when participating in community meetings, fewer reports of ridicule and discouragement from women and to a lesser extent from men. Some women expected that men would grant them greater respect when participating in meetings, that more respect is given to men whose wives do participate, there were even some anecdotal reports of greater acceptability for men to complete household chores pertaining to water, typically regarded as being within women's domain. These were best expressed by a woman in Canolo who noted, there's a couple across the street. The man used to be very arrogant and would say, if a woman wants me to fetch water, she should also pay for the dowry. However, it is interesting to see him fetching water these days. It's important to note that to a substantial extent, many of the harmful gender norms identified at baseline were still expressed in both communities. In particular, our evaluation showed that the impacts of Upward were more limited in Lulanzi. 
We hypothesize that this may be because Canolo is a much more heterogeneous culture with a mix of religions and ethnic groups, as opposed to a more monolithic, tighter culture in Mulanzi, but it would take more in-depth research to tease this out. To conclude, we've learned from Upward that failing to identify social norms and challenging those that limit women's full participation is a missed opportunity, both for advancing gender equality as well as achieving desired wash outcomes. The consequences of not having women's participation and representation in water governance means water services won't fit the needs of the whole community and continue to marginalize women and other underrepresented groups. Moreover, training in self-efficacy and motivation to participate in governance structures is insufficient to achieve more equitable governance without changes in social norms. We believe the upward intervention provides evidence that gendered social norms change programs can have identifiable impacts on women's participation in water-related decision-making over a short period of time, in this case, four months. Though not designed to evaluate norm change as rigorously as the intervention, the project inline evaluation conducted a year after upwards end found similar impacts. While other interventions have used larger, multi-level strategies to affect gender norms, Upward has shown that targeted community mobilization requiring relatively limited resources can nonetheless promote initial changes in social norms. Given the nature of social norms to shift slowly, we hope Upward's full impact may continue to grow. Thank you. Well, I hope all you listening in enjoyed those presentations as much as I did. What a great discussion. We have now heard from Radhika on how federal agencies can prioritize investments in water, climate resilient infrastructure, and integrate equity throughout policymaking. We heard from Yafet on the importance of cooperation among stakeholders for flood warning systems. And Ashwin spoke about the need for flood forecasting and disaster management to enable informed decisions. Peter showed us how information flows, highlighting that access to information is key to building community resilience. Meanwhile, Caroline shared how the meaning of livelihood and capabilities are essential to an individual's resilience to climate vulnerability. Finally, Jake reminded us that participatory approaches not only include women in decision making, but can help shift power structures and ultimately who and how decisions are made. Once again, we encourage you to submit questions or comments via chat on the World Water Week plat Pathable platform. And we welcome you to the second and third parts of this seminar series, where the conversation on information, governance, and justice for climate resilience will continue. Session two, Connecting the Expertise, takes place tomorrow, Tuesday, 24 August at 3 p.m. Central European time with a live panel discussion. And session three, Making the Case, will take an interactive dive into climate and water litigations. To accommodate participation from various time zones, session three will occur twice. First on Wednesday, 25 August at 10 a.m. Central European time, and then again Thursday, 26 August at 5 p.m. Central European time. Don't forget to bring your questions, comments, and feedback. We hope to see you there. In closing, I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our speakers for lending your time and expertise on these important topics. Thank you as well to my seminar team, Dr. Yenny Gronwell from CWE and Dr. Phil Graham from SMHI and of course, our four co-convening organizations. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll see you later this week.